Dr. Whelan is, of course, well known for his scholarship instruction. He's well recognized. But um, if you don't know, one of the reasons he's here today is because Joe, Micah, and I um, uh, were introduced to him personally over the summer at Oxford, where he is a professor, of course. Um, we were at the Ohio State University summer program at St. Anne's College, and we attended his courses in European Union law, which were some of the best education I've had. So um, I hope uh, you'll pay par careful attention. Dr. Whelan is very well known. He's in Virginia because he's a um, visiting professor at Washington and Lee and agreed to come and speak uh, with us today. But two of my most memorable moments with Dr. Whelan over the summer were spending, I think it must have been how many hours, Joe, at least 10 hours on the bus from Oxford to London as we attempted to rush to Middle Temple. It, it was, I would never been in traffic like that. That was really, really impressive. But even more, it must have, I, I, I can't recall. People were dying and getting off and eating each other. But um, the other event was, um, I think it was the final, uh, final class class and to demonstrate a case about European Union law brought in um, a beer for everyone. So we all had beers in class as we celebrated um, <laughs> the, end of the, uh, the end of the course. Okay, so quickly, Dr. Whelan, I'm going to read his biography and then we'll begin. Um, he has been a visiting research fellow um, at the University of California, Berkeley, a senior research officer in law at the University of Oxford. Um, he's a member of the University of Oxford Faculty of Law, visiting professor of law at the University of Texas, um, senior Strom Thurmond Distinguished Visiting Chair at the University of South Carolina School of Law, uh, University of Warwick, uh, visiting professor of law at Ohio State, associate director of international law programs, University of Oxford, uh, the Francis Lewis Scholar in Residence, Washington and Lee, visiting lecturer of law, Washington and Lee, visiting lecturer at the, I'll, I, I won't pronounce this correctly, the Curious Law School in Hamburg, and he is, of course, a distinguished barrister um, and is widely published. Uh, so I think we're ready to begin. Welcome, uh, Professor Dr. Whelan. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, of course, I handed out the beer in the final class shortly before handing out the evaluation form. <laughs> went down very well. Okay, so today, as you can see from the picture, I'm going to talk about the United Nations. And you probably recognize the United Nations building in New York City. Of course, it's in New York City, but it's not in New York. And it's not, in New it's not even in New York State. It's not in the United States. It's international territory, which is why no American federal, state, or local officer, whether police, military, or any other, can enter that building without permission, which is why the UN has its own firefighting force its own safety officers, its own post office. Uh, one New York mayor threatened to prohibit New York school children from visiting the building. The UN, he said, is not safe. Was he talking about the building or was he talking about the UN itself? <laughs> the UN, of course, is in New York City, but it's the head of the so-called international community. And today I want to ask, what does the UN do? And I want specifically to ask, does the UN do anything for you? Or is it a mission impossible? Of course, many people know that the United Nations does peacekeeping and humanitarian aid. Uh, many people know that there's a General Assembly, 193 member states, uh, states. South Sudan was the latest to join in 2011. Will Palestine be next? Many people know there's a Security Council, 15 rotating members, but five permanent members with the veto. They've also heard the names of many of the UN Secretaries General, people like Dag Hammarskjöld, Youth Ant, Boutros Boutros Ghali, who died this month, Kofi Annan, and currently Ban Ki-moon. And if they don't recognize those names, they may recognize the names of the many UN ambassadors, the famous personalities who highlight what the UN does, or at least try to do so, because many people will be unaware that these people actually have the representation with the UN. So people know quite a lot about the United Nations. And not surprisingly, there are quite strong opinions, both for and against. Maybe some of you here today. But did you know peacekeeping and humanitarian aid was not the reason why the United Nations was created. They were not the original mission. And they, are, uh, uh, and they are definitely not the only mission of the United Nations today. For example, did you know 
that the United Nations was the world's most authoritative, independent voice on the state of the planet. The UN's specialist agency, the World Meteorological Organization, through its Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has reported no fewer than five times on global warming. Uh, and the UN report is the closest the world will ever get to a scientific consensus. So what else? Well, did you know that every time you fly, your safety is managed through another UN agency, the International Civil Aviation Organization? It sets standards that hopefully make it safer for all of us to fly. And when you all go on your cruises from Norfolk, do you know who regulates your safety? Well, it's the IMO, the International Maritime Organization. And so it goes on. Even organizations predating the United Nations, like the Universal Postal Union, set up in 1874, is now a UN agency. So if we ask the question, United Nations, is it a mission impossible? We have to ask, well, what mission? Because there are a lot of UN agencies with a lot of missions with very little to do with peacekeeping and humanitarian aid. And some of these are good missions. So much so that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, along with Al Gore. So, today, I want to look, ask three questions. First of all, what exactly was the original mission of the United Nations? And why was it a mission impossible from the start? Secondly, how has the mission changed over time? And thirdly, what is, what is its mission now? And is that a mission possible or a mission impossible? So let's start with the original mission. Why was the United Nations created? And you probably all know the answer. Just like its predecessor, the League of Nations, the answer is war and conflict. The person pushing hardest for its creation was the American president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He'd seen the League of Nations fail. Why? Because it was set up after World War I. So there was no sense of urgency, no clear vision. So even though it was an American president, Woodrow Wilson, who proposed the League of Nations, the American Senate later rejected it. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt made sure that the UN Charter was drafted during World War II. The war was still on. So here were the leaders in the 1940s having the greatest lesson anybody could possibly have about the disaster that is war. So all of them were determined to act. And that's how the United Nations was born. In fact, the original name was suggested to Roosevelt by the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And that was in 1941, Nations United in War. And in 1942, Roosevelt invited 26 nations to San Francisco to sign what he called a Declaration by United Nations. Now this is 1942, not 1945. And in fact, Germany and Japan surrendered not to the Allies, but to the United Nations. If you see the colors on the Allied force insignia, they are the national flags of the Allies, but at the bottom, the blue color is the color of the United Nations and its objective of peace. Now, understanding the UN's wartime origins is a reminder that the United Nations was created not as some liberal accessory, but out of hard, realistic, political necessity to win the war. And the vision of Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin was clear. The United Nations would win the war, and after victory, it would win the peace. How? A new world organization which, quote, armed with great power, will guard the rights of all states, great or small, from aggression. It will be, to quote again, the UN will be fully authorized to do everything necessary to defend peace and to avert new aggression. So the mission was guard and protect. 
do everything necessary to stop aggression. And the mission was fully authorized. So in terms, the original mission was collective security. We will protect you. So when the United Nations is criticized for being the world's police force, it is. Like when General Eisenhower addressed the troops in World War II, landing in France, he told them, the United Nations is defeating the Germans. And now the United Nations will provide collective security for everyone. So the Security Council was given power to take action, to meet threats. Power to make decisions, decisions which states must carry out. That's why they're called Security Council mandates. And the Security Council was supposed to be the true seat of power, with the power to keep the international peace. So no one could be against it. But will it work, the leaders were asked. Joe Stalin, he said, it will be effective if the great powers continue to act in a spirit of unanimity and accord. So that was the original mission. Why was it a mission impossible from the very start? And I want to suggest two reasons. First of all, it was out of date, even in 1945. And secondly, the assumptions were wrong. So first of all, why was it out of date? Well, the UN Charter was adopted in June 1945 by 51 member states but hardly any of the 51 knew about the Manhattan Project, the secret American, British, and Canadian project begun in 1942 to develop nuclear weapons, the atomic bomb. Nor did they know that the very next month in July 1945, the first nuclear test was due to take place. The first the world knew about any of this was when the first and second atomic bombs were dropped on Japan in August 1945. Now, this was a huge development in human history. And the security part of the UN Charter already looked old-fashioned because there was no mention of nuclear weapons. And the assumptions were wrong, too. The assumption that the wartime alliance would survive. That's what the five permanent members of the Security Council is all about, to monitor the peace and, if necessary, to enforce it. In other words, to rule them all. But within a year or two, as Winston Churchill famously put it, an iron curtain had descended across Europe, and the Cold War had started. And far from being the great disinterested group of five important nations impartially dictating world peace, they had become the major threat to world peace because of the nuclear arms race. So for nearly 40 or more years, the original collective security mission of the United Nations was doomed. And the security part of the charter, which is chapter seven, was used only once in Korea, and it was only used in Korea because the Soviet representative was absent. Instead, the UN's mission became preventing a nuclear war between the great powers in the East and the West. This was the mad world, the world of mutually assured destruction that the UN operated in for 40 years. But the UN actually did several times play a key role in preventing nuclear war. In probably the greatest crisis during this period, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the UN Secretary General, Yu Thant, played what President Kennedy called a vital role in preventing a Soviet strike on the United States. Yu Thant, Kennedy said, has put the world deeply in his debt. So the UN was not powerless when the conflict was between the major powers. Nor was it powerless when the conflict was between the proxy powers of the East and the West. And of course, the UN helped when no one else could. 
Only the UN could provide ways to compromise, to wind down, to save face, and so on. Only the UN could stop the Cold War becoming a hot war. Who else? But the original mission, impossible. And so the UN had to find new missions. And I'd like to mention three. The first new mission it found was peacekeeping. The UN actually invented peacekeeping. It wasn't in the original charter. So the UN uses diplomacy to prevent and to resolve conflicts. It tries to separate forces to maintain ceasefires, and it's done so at least 69 times since 1945. And not only in Africa, but all, all over the world. And overall, has it done a good job? Well, according to the well-respected RAND Corporation, two out of every three missions are largely successful. Right now, there are 123,000 peacekeepers uh, from 128 countries involved in 16 missions on four continents. And the peacekeeping mission of the UN has radically changed the role of the Secretary General. When it was created, the idea that the Secretary General would be an administrator, a secretary. But because of the peacemaking role, the Secretary General is now the world's peacemaker general. And of course, some people are better at the art of peace than others. The second new mission concerned decolonization. In 1945, when the UN was founded, 750 million people, that's about one third of the world's population, lived in colonies. The UN Charter did promote self-government, but no one predicted how fast decolonization would take place. It took place over a period of about 20 years, and people expected it will take at least 100 years. And it could have been extremely bloody and violent, taking large colonial empires away from mostly European countries. In fact, decolonization went through with extraordinarily little violence. A UN resolution proclaimed the necessity of bringing a speedy and unconditional end to colonialism. Over 80 colonies became independent, 80 new countries in a period of about 20, 25 years. Amazing. Today, fewer than 2 million live in so-called uh, non-self-governing territories. It's one of the great achievements of the UN. And of course, decolonization more than doubled the number of member states of the United Nations which meant that the United Nations again changed its focus to focus on issues like development and poverty, human rights, social justice. But it's the third new mission of the United Nations which is probably the most important. And that's to meet the emerging challenges of globalization. Because so many activities, so many human activities have become global since the United Nations was created. So there is a need for global coordination strategies and therefore an obvious mission for the UN, a global compact. And within the UN system, there is a whole raft of agencies with a whole variety of missions. I mentioned three global missions at the, far, at the start, climate, uh, maritime uh, and aviation. But there are many others dealing with, for example, international finance health, education, science, and culture, intellectual property, tourism, labor, children, telecommunications, food and agriculture, industrial development, the environment, refugees, population, drugs and crime, training and research, social development. And there are other agencies that have special relationships with the United Nations dealing with atomic energy, and chemical weapons. So as I said at the start, when we ask the question, United Nations, is it a mission impossible? We have to say, what mission? Because so much of what the UN is engaged in, so many of those missions are important missions that affect all of us, no matter who we are and no matter where we live. And many would agree that this part of the UN, 
is very much a mission possible. So if the UN didn't exist, we'd probably have to create it. But inevitably, perhaps, the UN, we are drawn back to its original mission of security and peace. And we say, OK, that mission was doomed for maybe 40 years. But what about now, in the 21st century, after all, the Cold War has ended? And of course, at first, the end of the Cold War was that champagne moment. At last, the UN can do what it was set up to do. And it did, straight away, immediately. As I said, Chapter 7 of the <coughs> Charter was used only once before in Korea. But in 1991, the Security Council voted for getting Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And Chapter 7 has been used many, many times since then and in many different ways. For example, like setting up the International Criminal Tribunals for Rwanda and for the former Yugoslavia. Chapter 7 has even been used to deal with the piracy problem off the Horn of Africa and Somalia. So why do many people think the champagne went so flat? Well, you only have to look at Rwanda and Yugoslavia in the 1990s to see why. Because the atrocities there shocked the world. But it wasn't just the atrocities. It was the failure of the United Nations to deal with them. Rwanda was the first of many horrific atrocities in the 90s and beyond. The UN, everyone, knew about the de decades of conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis. And when a civil war broke out in 1990, the UN moved in 1993, but it was being warned by its own experts there was a serious risk of genocide. When the UN did send in troops to monitor a peace and power sharing agreement, the Canadian general, Romeo Dallaire, saw immediately how dangerous the situation was. So in January 1994, he faxed to the UN's peacekeeping uh, operations department, led then by Kofi Annan, later to be a secretary general, he sent the notorious genocide fax. And this fax informed the UN of, quote, a planned, even an announced mass slaughter, which was to take place imminently. And so General Dallaire asked the UN for authority to confiscate weapons. Instead, Kofi Annan ordered him to cease and desist and to avoid the use of force. And the genocide, when it did happen, was triggered in April, on April the 6th, 1994, when the president's plane was shot down. In 100 days, about three quarters of all the Tutsis in Rwanda, 800,000 were slaughtered. That's over five every minute. Killed not by bomb, and not by bullet, but by machete, one by one. Some Tutsis tried to shelter, and some were lucky. Some of you may have seen the movie Hotel Rwanda, where a brave hotel manager saved many Tutsis. But others were protected by the United Nations. They were not so lucky. The UN troops were protecting European and Rwandans in a school which was surrounded. But as soon as the Europeans were evacuated, the Rwandans were left there, and they all, every single one, was massacred. So the UN, instead of protecting Tutsis seeking refuge, protected UN neutrality in a civil war. Now all this was happening while Yugoslavia was breaking up, another consequence of the end of the Cold War. Because the Balkans too, a long history of conflict. But after General Tito took power in 1945, there were decades of unity and stability. But when Tito died in 1980, and especially after the end of the Communist Party in 1990, well, Yugoslavia began to break up, and a civil war began. The UN sent in troops again, this time in 1992, to monitor a ceasefire and to protect civilian detainees. By March 1995, there were 39,000 troops. But the UN failed to prevent what's been called the worst <coughs> massacre and the worst ethnic crimes on European soil since the rise of Hitler. The UN, UN had declared Srebrenica, 
home to 23,000 Bosnian Muslims, a safe area. But in 1995, the town was defended by just 429 lightly armed Dutch soldiers. The Serb forces attacked. But, but weren't the UN forces authorized this time to use force? Yes, they were, but only in self-defense. And the Serbs weren't attacking the UN forces. And if they had used force and taken sides, then that would have seen, been seen as losing independence. And so they did nothing. And the world watched on CNN as about 8,000 Bosnian men and boys were killed. So what's the problem? If the Security Council is using force to get rid of Saddam Hussein in Kuwait, why isn't it using force to prevent genocide? Now, this is the International Law Society, so you all know the answers to these questions, but, and I'll still go through it. You know about the hundreds of years of fundamental principles of international law, the two fundamental principles. First of all, the principle of national sovereignty. Each nation state decides its own affairs, internal affairs, without external interference. It's the idea that the sovereign is in control. Second principle is sovereign equality. No one state has priority over any other, no matter how big or small, rich or poor, strong or weak. And those two principles are fiercely defended. Many governments view them as a defense against threats or pressures from more powerful countries that want to promote their economic or political interests. No wonder the UN has had to respect those two fundamental principles, or if you prefer, the UN has had to defer to them. How else could the UN get member states to sign up to the Charter? But these principles fundamentally undermine the role that the United Nations has been asked to play. Because while the UN is an international organization, it's built on the idea of the nation state, national sovereignty, and national sovereign equality. And that's why the overriding desire in Rwanda and Yugoslavia was to keep neutrality and independence. But what was really needed was force. You cannot be a peacekeeper if there's no peace to keep. You need a peacemaker. So when NATO did launch airstrikes in 1995, they immediately paid off. The Dayton Accords had been drafted in 1992, but they were ignored. After the airstrikes in 1995, they were rapidly accepted by the Serbs. The same thing happened in Kosovo after NATO airstrikes in 1998. It led rapidly to troop withdrawals and about 750,000 refugees returned to Kosovo. So at the start of the 21st century, the UN realized it needed a new mission. And in 2005, after the largest <coughs> ever gathering of world leaders, it got one. A new charter was agreed. Yes, the UN will continue its peacekeeping mission in war-torn areas. Uh, but now it will also do what it calls peace building, trying to help states emerging from war. And yes, the UN confirmed, yes, states have rights. You've got rights to sovereignty, to territorial integrity, to political independence. But for the first time in the history of international law, the UN declared states also have responsibilities. Each state has a responsibility to protect, to protect its civilian populations from atrocities like genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and <coughs> ethnic cleansing. And if they won't protect their people, we will. And if necessary, if peaceful measures fail, we will use force, chapter seven. So sovereignty has been redefined in international law. Sovereignty resides with the people, not with the monarchs and the dictators. Sovereignty is not a right to control, but a responsibility to protect. So if state authorities do not protect their peoples, 
they lose the right of non-interference. And the UN Security Council, it gains the legal basis it needs to protect civilians from violence perpetrated by their own governments. Now, this is a revolution in international law in the books and a revolution in the mission of the UN. But can the principle of responsibility to protect be turned into practice? The answer, of course, is yes and no. Let me give one example of each. The yes examples include Libya. In 2011, when Colonel Gaddafi threatened to slaughter civilians, show no mercy, he said, when he ordered his forces to cleanse Libya house by house and began to carry out that threat. Ten in the Security Council voted for intervention and five abstained. So all necessary measures to protect civilians under threat from Gaddafi were authorized. The Security Council has actually invoked the responsibility to protect measure in about 25 times since 2005. And there have been other successes. But there have been failures too uh, in Darfur and, of course, most obviously right now in Syria. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has said that the conflict in Syria is a test of everything the UN stands for. So far, you could argue the UN has failed that test. And it's because of the dreaded veto power of the permanent five in the Security Council. We know 250,000 or more civilians have been killed, millions have been displaced within Syria, millions have become refugees from Syria. And then the spillover effect in Turkey and Afghanistan, in Jordan, ISIS, migration crisis in Europe, and so on. So the big challenge facing the UN is, can we create the responsibility not to veto? But it's very difficult. Some have criticized Russia and China for using the veto several times on Syria. But would the UK or the US give up its veto power? I don't think so. The veto gives the five a unique power to protect and promote their national interests some would argue, at the expense often of global interests. But what about you? Would you be willing to put global interests ahead of your national interests? Some say putting the UN ahead of American interests is un-American. <laughs> so no wonder it's impossible to stop international politics playing out at the UN. And so the UN is used by many member states as a political football and an opportunity to express their political biases. Take the UN Human Rights Council as a recent example. Israel has been condemned 62 times since that council was created uh, 10 years ago. That's more than any other, all other countries combined. And who are the Human Rights Council members? Well, they include China, Cuba, Qatar, Kazakhstan, and Russia. And where does the chair of a key Human Rights Council committee come from? Answer, Saudi Arabia. But before you criticize the UN, make sure you also question whether your country is any better when it comes to playing politics with human rights. After all, the US State Department said, quote, the United States and Saudi Arabia are close allies, and we welcome this appointment. And what has been the British response to the sentence of beheading given to Ali al-Mir, who was arrested in Saudi Arabia in 2012, age 17? Why was he arrested? Because he wanted equal rights for Shias in the Sunni-majority country. Well. While Britain was condemning the sentence and calling for clemency, it was also negotiating a 5.9 million training contract. Training for what? The Saudi Arabian prison service. Not exactly turning principle into practice. It was only after a public and political outcry when critics said, why are 
Why is Britain helping the Saudis to flog, stone, and amputate that the bid was withdrawn in October last year? So back to our main question. United Nations, mission impossible or mission possible? At the end of the day, this is a matter for you. But I'd like to leave you with three final thoughts. First, the UN, as I have shown very briefly, is changed and is changing. It's not a simple organization. So beware simplistic opinions, whether hopes are unrealistically high for the UN or totally against. <coughs> It's very easy to criticize the UN, but as Mark Twain so aptly put it, any jackass can kick a barn down, but it takes a carpenter to build one. So strong opinions are okay. Simplistic opinions I don't like. Even one of the uh, United States' harshest critics of the UN, that's John Bolton, the American, said that many of the UN specialized agencies were doing important work and <coughs> that missions have been worthwhile and successful. During his time as the UN's US ambassador, John Bolton strongly supported several Security Council resolutions. Because the UN is not only not a simple organization, but we really do need to get real about the challenges it faces and about the ori original mission it was given. Because as Dag Hammarskjöld put it, the UN was not created to take humanity to heaven, but to save it from hell. The second point is this. If that has been the mission, to save humanity from hell, well, the UN has been vital time and time again. Maybe this is why the UN, its agencies, and its staff have won the Nobel Peace Prize no fewer than 10 times. Like in 1965 for UNICEF, 1988 for peacekeeping, 2001 for the UN's work for a better organized and more peaceful world, and as I mentioned in 2007 for disseminating the science on climate change. Of course, there are UN failures like Rwanda, and Yugoslavia and now in Syria. But there are successes too, like the groundbreaking resolution in September 2013 to destroy Syria's stockpile of chemical weapons. The first time an international mission has been sent into a country during active conflict to oversee the removal of weapons of mass destruction. And the organization that completed that work won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2013. And in December, uh, December last year, just a few weeks ago, finally, the Security Council did adopt a resolution on Syria, setting out a roadmap for peace. Times Newspaper of London called it a major milestone. <coughs> well, well, we'll see. And finally, third point, to those who say the UN has failed, Look at the wars, look at the atrocities, the injustices. One resolution has not done much for Syria. Where's the UN in Ukraine, in Gaza? What about ISIS? And, go, and so it goes on. Well, you're right. But don't forget the many global missions that the UN has taken on and the many successes. And do ask yourselves the question, do the two rationales for setting up the UN in the first place. This is the signing in 1945. Do those rationales that guided Roosevelt and Churchill and the others, do they still remain relevant? In other words, should there be a forum to pool resources, to coordinate and cooperate, and to resolve disputes through dialogue rather than conflict? And if there is conflict, should we try to unite for peace and have international peacekeeping when force is required? If the answer to those questions is yes, then we already have it, and it's called the United Nations. And maybe that's partly why war is actually in decline. 
and why fewer people have died in conflicts in the first decade of the 21st century than in any decade of the 20th. Wars between states have almost completely disappeared. The only bad news, of course, is terrorism. Not that terrorism is new anywhere. It's not. But there has been a dramatic increase in high casualty terrorist attacks and a corresponding escalation in, of course, terror and fear. But let me finish with some more words of Dag Hammarskjöld. Yes, our world is a stormy place. Emergencies, failing states, humanitarian crises, natural disasters, and so on. And here's a ship in stormy seas. But whose fault is the storm? Hammarskjöld was surely right when he said it would be silly to put the blame for the storm on the ship's crew. It would be silly to blame the storm on the ship. It's not the UN's fault that the world is a stormy place, but it is stormy. Maybe, that, maybe that's why the world needs a United Nations, but also why it is so often a mission impossible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very quickly, those journal members who have to go to the Carson event, and then if you have a few moments, Doctor, we like, will entertain a few questions if anyone has them. Thank you very much, Doctor. That was excellent. Okay, well, I think there are some time for questions. I'm sure. very happy to take any if there are any, any questions or comments. <laughs> or, yes, ma'am. So, my question relates to the idea of state sovereignty um, interacting with the United Nations. So, um, with the rise of, well, let me rephrase how, how do you think the United Nations should approach dealing with um, terrorist organizations like ISIS that don't have a nation state, um, so they're not signatory to an agreement where, whereby they give up you know, non-intervention policies, etc. What would the legal approach, I guess, or legal justification for the United Nations based on international law be for um, keeping the peace with um, non-affiliated extremists? Right. Well, uh, so can everybody hear the question? If I repeat it? You heard it? Okay. You don't care what she says? <laughs> She's asking about essentially a, a, putting a case study on it, um, like ISIS, since it's not uh, a sovereign state as such. What should be, I guess, the international community's way of dealing with something like that? Well, uh, ISIS, as I understand it, would be regarded as an organization committing crimes against humanity. Now, again, crimes against, we, we didn't get too much into international human rights, but one of, the confusion about, one of the confusions about crimes against humanity is people think, oh, they're just terrible crimes. So any terrible crime like what ISIS is doing is a crime against humanity. Crime, crimes against, there's a debate about what crimes against humanity might mean, but it, what it certainly means is that it is horrible crimes, but committed as part of an official policy of, of wiping out uh, people, civilians. And ISIS qualifies under that definition of a crime against humanity. It may, it may fall under genocide rules as well. So there is an international law uh, response to an ISIS threat. The problem with ISIS, and I guess the problem with Syria, is the political problem, is how you get the international political community to act collectively in the way that was hoped for at the end of the Second World War to deal with anybody, uh, internal genocide, internal civil wars, or something that's slightly new in, in probably in our lifetimes, which is an organization that doesn't respect any sovereign borders um, and which kind of sets up its own, its own sort of state. So there's no question in my mind that if you're asking from, from a legal point of view, they, they qualify for action. Um, how, how you then do, deal with it is a, is a political issue. And I mean, if this was 15, 20 years ago, the U US would be having troops on the ground. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised. But after Iraq and Afghanistan, there's much less of a political um, will to, to, to engage in that kind of intervention. Um, and same goes for, for my country and probably other countries as well. 
Um, I guess with the ISIS threat, they're, 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 they're linking it back mainly to Assad and Syria and trying to resolve Syria. But of course, uh, you know, ISIS is, is one of many similar kinds of organizations in different parts of the world, like in Africa. You could ask the same question about uh, organi you know, Boko Haram in Africa and so on and so forth. It seems to me that they qualify for international intervention, but you know, this is a talk about the UN. I haven't got into the difficulty UN has in raising troops, raising resor having resources, and all those sort of practical and political issues that make intervention very difficult. Yes, um, do you think potentially some of the, the resistance to the UN has to do with um, the culture that seems to be because our world is getting so much smaller with access? You know, we can communicate with anyone, go anywhere now very quickly and very shortly. Uh, to where it seems like everyone really wants to have a subjective truth in their own way. Well, just because this is how you and your culture sees it, it's not how me and my culture see it. Um, so who who gives you the right to come in and say this? So do you think maybe some of the pushback with the UN, um, especially with you said their new charter um, in 2005 um, about human gen genocide, uh, wars against humanity, they're essentially stating an objective qualifier that's enforcing someone's beliefs or someone says that you cannot do this despite what your subjective truth of your culture is. Mm. Do you see that as being potentially part of the problem with something like Boko Haram or ISIS is that it's then hard to get everyone to, to get around this one objective truth because not everyone ascribes to that objective truth? Yeah, I mean, in a sense, uh, there's nothing new in history. It's all the same story again. So you could get a... a if you think about international human rights and um, can we agree on what human rights are, well, we possibly can agree on what human wrongs are, but what we do about it is, is much more problematic. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, you, one of the great things about the UN is that you can, it really is a good, it really is a good debating tool because uh, unless you're ideologically committed to the UN or ideologically hating the UN, and you can't engage in a debate at all, then you can have a very interesting debate because you, almost every question like that one, you can argue it both ways. But the world is clearly smaller in the sense of globalization and contacts and internet and everything else and travel and, and whatever. Um, so that, that, I said, means it's an obvious mission for the United Nations. You could, argue, you could argue the opposite, which I think is what you were implying, which is that, well, the world is so small now, we, you know, we should revert back to our own interests. And in fact, our own interests may be more than our, ourselves, so we might have regional groups. So you see, you will see organizations being created now sort of in competition with the United Nations, um, either regional blocks or Asian Development Bank or, you know, people don't, people, you know, Americans may, may, or may or may not know just how influential the United States is in, say, the World Bank. And of course, just to give you another example of the debate, some people hate the United Nations because it's clearly a plot to create a world socialist government. There are other people who hate the UN because it's clearly an American imperialist project that wants to take over the world. I <laughs> can't reconcile those two positions. But you can certainly, you know, present interesting arguments to support both those conclusions. My, my view is, if you look at the whole picture, you, you, you know, both conclusions are right. Is it, is it a plot to take over the world? Is it an American plot? Yes. It's just a, it's such a complicated organization, you can't reduce it to this kind of simplistic soundbite. So I think, I think um, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that uh, people, uh, especially when people see the UN as being fairly impotent um, or ineffective, then, you know, then, you, then, then there's much more of an incentive to do what you think is right for yourself and put, you know, put American interests first or put British interests first. So. Yes, sir. Can you comment a bit more about the responsibility to protect and, and whether, in fact, it's customary international law? If so, how are we really going to implement this in practice against the well-established principles of, of sovereign equality? Well, I just studied Darfur. <laughs> I mean, the Darfur in, in Sudan, West, Western Sudan, began before responsibility to protect was, was, was signed up to. Um, so it was not ongoing. Um, but they, in fact, the first ever responsibility to protect resolution related to Darfur. Um, and most people would say it, it has failed. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, if we're going to move on slightly to like the International Criminal Court, I mean, the president of, of Sudan, Sudan has been 
indicted before the International Criminal Court, and he's travelled kind of freely to several countries and not been arrested by ICC member states and all that kind of stuff. So um, it, it's, it's in Darfur, you would say, well, it, you can see its limitations. I mean, this is the problem, isn't it? Um, as I said, it's turning it from principle into practice. And uh, I mean, as law students and as lawyers, we all know there's often a gap between the law in the books and the law in action or whatever, you know, the so-called gap and everything. This, this sort of international law <laughs> and local realities, the gap may be, may be even wider. Um, and so there are those times when there is a consensus in the international community to actually do something, they're pretty, pretty rare. Um, but they do occur, occur occasionally. And I mean, you know, then you're going to get into these other questions about, well, you know, is it really about law or is it about politics? Um, are, are we intervening in Kuwait because of oil? Are we, we don't really care about Sudan. We don't have any interest there. We do care about Crimea, but we, you know. So geopolitical issues cro cut across all these, all these discussions. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why I, I try and take the UN out of this context a bit and say, well, okay, um, its original mission was doomed. Its, it's new mission is pretty hard to achieve, but it's still doing some other things that, that, that may be good. And even, you know, even getting uh, um, uh, Ahmadinejad and Gaddafi to go to New York and spout off is actually quite a good thing. Um, I, 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 I mean, people don't like it, <laughs> um, but uh, it's an opportunity to uh, to hear what they've got to say, which, which in our, you know, in our ideology, is, is always a good thing. Uh, even if not particularly what we want to hear. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I've got no magic wand. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. So you talked a lot about the you know, different functions of the UN. I very much appreciate that. We can we can really hammer on, on one area and it's not productive. But human rights, and, and you mentioned Israel, and that's a great example of perhaps uh, some of the failures, whether we can sit here and say Israel's great and never breaches human rights or not. It's pretty objective fact that they're not near breaching uh, the treaties in, in near as much as many of the other nations. So is human rights one area where perhaps the UN is causing more problems than actually helping? Well, again, that's a good question, which, you know, is an empirical question. I mean, we have to sort of look at the evidence. I mean, one of the reasons why the US said it welcomed the new chair of this, this, this committee is a committee that appoints experts to look at human rights abuses in, in countries. So it's a very important. Human Rights Council Committee and the Saudi Arabian took over. One of the things the U.S. State Department said was, well, it, 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 this is it's kind of soft power. I guess it's soft power or it's, um, you know, it, it, if you come in contact with other values and other, other, other ideas, you're, you're, you're more open to influence and so on. So I think that was part of the argument. But I, 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 could, I, could put you, I could give you stuff on the other side that would sort of shock you. I, I don't know if it would shock you or not. It probably wouldn't. But for example, the, the, the Saudi Arabian... Uh, UN ambassador in Geneva, they have an office in Geneva, said something like, yeah, we, we have a very high respect for, for human rights. Sharia law is the highest form of, of human rights you can have. And we, but it, so, now, I'm not going to go into Sharia law and what it says and what it doesn't say and all that kind of debate, but um, you, you can all say, I'm for human rights, uh, but, but you know, African Americans are not included. You know, I believe in equality, but not for women. You know. So the rhetoric and the reality is, is really the problem. So, um, and I mean, so Israel gets hit all the time, and that leads to fueling criticism of the United Nations. Um, and that's, that's hard if you're being criticized, but how, how, you know, how serious is that criticism? I, I don't know. I, I don't know, I'm not criticized 62 times in the last 10 years, <laughs> except by people like Christopher. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Okay, right, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for coming. There's more foods I would like to take some. You're welcome.